I would like to welcome everybody. Um, this is the first Tile Network webinar. Um, Tile stands for Teaching, Innovation, and Learning Enhancement. We started this network a year ago, and we have been running this as an external speaker series um, with people coming in and giving talks. We thought we would like to expand a little bit and be more local, uh, more global. Um, and have a wider reach of our um, seminar sessions. And so what we are trying out right now is to do a webinar where people from the, around the globe can join us when we discuss different um, research, different approaches to teaching and teaching innovation. <clears throat> so before we start, um, I will give you a bit of an um, introduction into um, this tool we are using. So here we have um, different um, functions. So on the bottom you have your microphone, that we can, you can manage your microphone and your camera and you can raise your hand. Um, we would ask you to um, keep everything muted. Um, in um, the time that the presenter is giving his presentation. Otherwise, it will be a lot of interference going on. On the right side, um, right um, bottom corner, you have a little icon. It's a um, panel that you can open. And if you open it, you can see a, a chat window. One window is to uh, write um, to the entire group. And we are recording this session. We are recording the video and the presentation, as well as your comments in um, the chat room. But you can also write private comments to people um, in, who joined us. And on the top um, panel, um, in case we use a virtual whiteboard, um, you have different um, tools to um, contribute to a brainstorming activity. Today, um, we would, oh yeah, if you haven't done so, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the general chat um, to briefly state where you're um, joining us from and um, what you do. Today, I would like to introduce and welcome our speaker, Dr. Susie um, Scofield. She's a reader in medical education um, and the PhD lead for the Center of Medical Education, uh, abbreviated CME. And she joined the Center for Medical Education uh, 12 years ago and um, has now the consulting role in, in that uh, program delivering um, the undergraduate of medicine uh, program. She has uh, published in, um, in scientific uh, journals and um, also facilitated workshops uh, locally and internationally. Um, <clears throat> she has moved, um, she had led the move from, um, of the master's program from paper to completely online um, and uh, from non-cohorted to cohorted and has developed modules um, in induction learning and teaching, technology enhanced learning and faculty development. Um, so today she will be talking about um, generating a sense of belonging with online learners and without further ado I will to start her presentation um, right now. Here we go. Everyone should be able to see this. Um, and yeah, I will pass um, to um, Susie to start. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, my colleague, Dr. Susie Peacock. Um, and she's involved with the QAA project um, that's um, on uh, one of the enhancement themes. Uh, developing a toolkit around sense of belonging. So because we're both working off my laptop, I'll get her to lean over and wave hello. Hello, lovely to meet you. Okay, so um, I'm going to, um, as the abstract said, I'm going to start by giving an introduction to what we've done at the Centre for Medical Education um, and how we've then moved online and the impact of introducing a feedback dialogue. And then I'll move from non-cohort to cohort um, and the impact of moving to cohort. And I'll explain some of those words um, as well. 
Um, and then we'll move on to sense of belonging and um, how we've been developing a toolkit as part of, a, of, of our uh, funded project. So, uh, Centre for Medical Education at a glance, um, it's part of the School of Medicine. Um, it was created by Professor Ronald Harden 40 years ago. You can see a young Professor Ronald Harden here uh, with the Queen Mother. And around 90% of our students are medical doctors. Uh, the others are other health professionals and around 30 percent are overseas uh, we deliver mainly online now but our, our main student body has always been distance though we have a small on campus um, and some students will combine both I, I learned a new word last week stackable degrees and realized that for the last 40 years we have been doing stackable degrees um, that is uh, our students can do the whole masters or they can come out with a PG cert or a PG dip. And our program is aimed both at those new to teaching and those who want to further develop. Um, and I realise I should have said um, questions, please type your questions, but I'm not looking at the type of questions at all. But we'll have a break halfway through to address some of your questions and comments. And then we'll do the same um, at the end of the presentation. So, where did we start over 40 years ago? Well, there wasn't the internet. People didn't have home computers. We were what's now known um, as first generation. So first generation distance learning, it was print based. Technology um, was the fact that it was, you know, we had a photocopier. In fact, we had someone employed purely to photocopy our course material. Um, and, you know, what we did was pretty pioneering at the time, even now it looks extremely antiquated. Where are current CME students based all over the world? And right from the beginning, we've had a we've developed an international feel to our program. Our program structure originally um, was very much based on a flexible approach, supporting very busy health professionals. We gave them a huge variety in options. Um, each of our units was three credits, a bit of a nightmare for administrators, um, and they could choose from 80. Some of them were core, but the majority, they had a huge choice of options, including uh, one on how to use the overhead projector. So if anyone still wants to study that, I'm afraid it's no longer accredited. Um, there was no compulsory teaching in Dundee. It was done in the student's own time with no fixed start or end dates and no submission, fixed submission dates. So very much student-led learning. All materials were posted out in big brown envelopes. And that included a photocopy of any papers that were referred to that the students had to read. So no reading list on TALIS, no developing library search skills. We, we gave them this whole pack, posted it out. And then we would mark their assignment as that was posted in. And we weren't really sure with our feedback. Obviously, you know, we were putting our pearls of wisdom, but weren't the students reading the feedback? And if they were, were they understanding it? And if they were understanding it, were they acting on it? And imagine if you're doing your three credit unit, you've been posted five so that you can get on, you do your first one, you send back your assignment, you move on to your next one. Maybe you're on to unit three or four by the time your feedback comes. Um, from the uh, first assignment, from the first unit. And so you can imagine opening up the envelope, looking, ah, oh, I passed, great. Next, you know, was, had we designed our program really to ensure that the students were encouraged to act on the feedback? So through JISC, we were funded to do what's um, known, well, we developed the name of the Interact Project. So looking at feedback dialogue. So our team, um, Rola Rajawi, Karen Barton, Sean McCallie and myself, supported by Lorraine Anderson, Natalie Lafferty, Grant Murray and David Walker. Um, our reference group, um, including David Bowd and David Nichols. Um, obviously, we had our funding from JISC. We also had funding from the then HEA for funding our interim workshop to share um, our thoughts so far. And of course, you know, huge thanks to our students and staff, both academic and administrative, for all their input and patience. So we looked, we did a narrative review of our external examiner's report. 
and our end of course evaluations. Our additional evaluation surveys conducted separately as part of the project in 2000 and 2011 as part of a major curriculum review and the postgraduate taught student experience survey. We looked very much at our assessment as our assignment strategy and we realized that you know, we, we needed to do a major redesign. We made the uh, modules 15 credits, we grouped units together and that allowed us to use larger assessments and we used the escape project tool developed by um, Mark Russell and colleagues at Hertfordshire and this helped us visualize you know our high stake assessments and and start to think about where might we put informative assessments so through all of that research we did, we identified five problems we did, identified an inconsistency in the quality and quantity of the feedback provided. Our assessment design was over-reliant on essays, and as I've just mentioned, there were no formative assessments. The timeliness of the feedback, and I've already um, discussed that a little bit, you know, the students, very variable on when they might get their feedback. I'd add to that, that you know, some of them were having to walk to a post office in. Um, in Africa to pick up their feedback, which was, you know, not something we'd actually considered. And now we had access to computers, you know, so could, could we make things better for them? There was no assessment and feedback dialogue. It was totally monologic. And we found from interviews, from um, evaluation feedback, from qualitative data, that the students did feel isolated. And not only the students, the tutors as well. Many of our tutors were working here in Dundee at CME, but some of them are, were across the globe. And, and that's something that we have even more um, tutors across the globe now. And they were feeling isolated. And actually, I'd say it's pretty isolating sitting in your room, doing all that marking, sending it off and not knowing whether the student has found it helpful or not. So in 2010, we moved online but we stayed as non-cohort. That meant that our students could still start and end any day of the year. They could post their assignments any day of the year. So it meant that we did have better feedback dialogue, but there was still slow or even no progression. We still weren't able to employ a social constructivist approach to our, learn, our education, even though I think that's what we all felt, you know, was a key philosophy of our educational approach and certainly one we used with our face to face students. And evaluations showed the students still felt isolated from their peers. Although we had put discussion fora online because students were starting and finishing and going through the module very different paces, um, you know, the evaluation would say, well, I didn't find the discussion boards very helpful. I would post something and then I wouldn't get a reply till five weeks later, if at all. And by that time I had moved on. Because our modules were always live, because people were coming on and going off at any time, it was very hard to update the module material. And although our numbers look great, and I think they peaked at about two and a half thousand, actually, if you converted that to a full time equivalent, because of the slow or no progression, actually, the FTE was not so good. Also, we were asking our students to pay by module. So, you know, to be very pragmatic, if they were stuck on the first module, we didn't actually get any more income out of them. But also, we weren't able to develop them any further. So we found many of them got stuck on that first module. Now, maybe some of them just signed up for that first module to have that line on their CV that they were studying with us. But I think the majority, actually, if you looked at the evaluations and looked at the um, interview data from the research, they, they just felt stuck. Um, one student fed back that they had wanted really wanted to get their assignment done that day. They had sat down at their desk at eight o'clock in the morning. They had an interruption for this, for that, for the other. And by the end of the day, they still hadn't finished their assignment because they had no firm deadline for submitting that assignment. 
they did not feel able to prioritise it over their colleagues' needs, over their patients' needs. So here's a couple of quotes from that um, uh, research. One of the students talking about moving, remember, from the paper-based to online, but still non-cohort. I have been able to engage in more of a dialogue with whoever has graded it. So whoever has graded it still doesn't know who's grading their work, hasn't built up any relationship with them, but says this has allowed a little more personality exchange and a little more support. When you have someone at the other end actually looking at what you're working so hard at and treating you as a person. And here's a quote from one of the tutors interviewed about the feedback dialogue. I also use it for closing the feed feedback loop. So if they tell me something's wrong or they don't understand it, then I'll also use what to say. Thank you for highlighting that. I have now changed it. So the tutors were reporting feeling a little bit more included. They knew where their feedback was having an impact. They also knew when their impact, uh, their feedback wasn't making sense to the students and could modify accordingly. And then in 2015, we redesigned, redesigned the whole course to be cohort. So that students starting and finishing on set dates and having very set dates for handing in their assignments. Our first module on the cohorted programme started January 2016. And we allowed our students on the old, the non-cohort programme to complete their stage. So if they were on the certificate, they could complete that on the non-cohort. That said, we encourage students to move to the cohort because we were so sure from all, all the work we had done and from the literature we had read that this was going to be better for them. Even if they thought, and many of them did, that no deadlines would fit in better with their work. So actually, you know, if you look at the literature, this is actually seen as counterintuitive around the need to increase the flexibility of education for rapidly changing groups of students. I've just given um, one citation there, Scott et al, 2018. There's a lot of talk in the show about the need for increased flexibility. But had we, had we found that there is something um, as too much flexibility? I like this um, quotation from what was then the Higher Education Academy. Flexible learning requires a balance of power between institutions and students and seeks to find ways in which choice can be provided that is economically viable and appropriately manageable for institutions and students alike. So here it's not only thinking about the student and what they think they want, it's looking at the needs. We need to be economically viable. We need to be able to appropriately manage our distance learning courses. And that also needs to take very much to mind the student needs and, and I would argue the funders' needs. Bergman et al. 2012 came up with a, a paper outlining characteristics of a truly flexible programme and asks, do learners have greater control over their learning? Are learners active and constructive rather than passive? Are teaching methods learning centred? And do learning resources meet the needs of the learners? So was our course truly flexible? Well, we felt that our students did have a good amount of control over their learning, and they were certainly active and constructive. And we were able to bring in social constructivism. So how did we maintain that flexibility? We have three intakes per year, January, May and September. So no longer 365, but more flexibility than, say, just the one September entry. Each award level can be completed in a year. However, students are given up to two years per level. And this offers busy health professionals flexibility by allowing planned breaks between modules. So they can plan their own learning, their own curriculum. Our cores are offered every presentation and the others are timetabled two years in advance. And again, getting over to the students the idea of their autonomy in this. They need to be planning their own learning. 
There's no compulsory teaching still in Dundee except for one week for the simulation module. All optional online course classes are recorded for later access and the discussion forum offer asynchronous peer and tutor support. And we've maintained a number of optional modules, so the students are still able to have some flexibility. But now that we're on to 20 credit modules for their, for example, their certificate, they have to do a core of learning and teaching and principles of assessment and then one optional module. There's no longer 80 different topics. And I don't think we mention overhead projectors anymore. So what impact did all that have on our course? Well, remember I had said that progression was not good, completion was not good. So here's a slide going, we don't yet have the 2018-19 figures, but here's up to 2017-18. So remember, we introduced the first module, January 2016, and look how the graduations have gone up, in particular for our certificate. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> And here is um, overall, I've just lumped them all together. The previous one showed how the main growth has been in certificate. And so we are certainly seeing people going through the course, progressing. A piece of work, this was um, by one of my colleagues, Rachel Cumberland, 2018. This is one of her interview participants saying it almost worked on the basis that a certain percentage of people would not engage in the non-cohort program this is. So this is from a tutor. It was a bit like a gym membership. If you have 100 people on the books, but 20 never turn up, these people are important to stay afloat, but it's not good for them. I think the new program is much better, not only educationally, but better morally to have people on it and engaged, <laughs> whether they like it or not. So I'm guessing this was remembering that some of them, of the students were sort of, you know, slightly dragged onto the cohort when it, because, you know, if they'd run out of time or if they were moving on to the next stage. But certainly our evidence so far is, and I'm, I'm working with Stella Howden on a project at the moment, looking more qualitatively at the impact for students moving from non-cohort to cohort. And they are certainly reporting that they like the fact that there are deadlines like the fact that there are discussions for them to be able to um, talk to their peers, lots of peer support going on. My colleague Mandy Moffitt, who I see, I wave to Mandy, um, has done a, an incredible amount of work in the first module in learning and teaching to really build in activities for them to develop those peer support um, groups that are so important. And we've also um, included one tutor marked formative for the majority of modules now. We're working our way through the program, but we've also included a lot of um, formative activities that are peer supported, um, maybe peer evaluated, mainly peer fed back on. We don't use peer assessment for summative. Um, also formatives that are computer um, fed back and ones where the student may, for example, see the gold standard answer um, on the computer and then be asked to evaluate and compare with their own answer. OK, I'm now going to stop um, for questions and comments so far. And uh, I think my uh, moderators are going to pose the questions and then we'll go on to um, the sense of belonging work. <laughs> I think our first question um, came from Carolina. Um, in that, how do you implement formative feedback in distance learning? Right, so um, we've done a number of things. Um, for example, in learning and teaching, the students will um, post in the discussion board their learning, uh, that they're, um, they have to develop a plan for a lesson. So they post up their lesson plan and then the others feed back on it. In the research module, um, they feed back on each other's proposals. We can, in the software, um, have it so that their own feedback won't be released until they've, for example, fed back onto other um, students' work. So these are really important considerations because we are time limited. 
you know, we, we would love to spend lots and lots of time individually with all the students, but actually we don't realistically have the time. And also we're finding that peer support. I mean, we know ourselves, you know, there's nothing like writing, uh, learning to write an academic paper than being on a review panel for an academic paper. You learn so much from giving feedback. And yet previously with the, with the tutor monologic um, model, it was us who were benefiting, the students weren't. That um, leads on to Carolina's next question which was about do you use peer-led teaching and distance learning and if yes how is it integrated we haven't yet but i think that is a great idea so i think that mandy <laughs> i'll throw it back to mandy now I, I think that would be a really nice thing to look at because again we know from from the research that if you ask someone to um you know, learn something because they're going to be assessed compared with if you ask them to learn something to teach, that then if you assess both groups, then it's the ones who thought that they were going to teach it have, have learned the, the most. But if we were doing it, we would certainly um, introduce, you know, webinars like this. The students could do a webinar and feedback. I mean, certainly Mandy has set up areas, an area on Blackboard Collaborate where the students can just set up their own little groups with no tutor involvement at all. We had another question. Now, my apologies for possibly pronouncing this wrong, but is it Jani um, or Jeannie has asked, do you encourage students to develop peer support groups which you don't belong to? I know that Mandy's posted that students set up WhatsApp groups at the start of the module, which aren't joined, and it's entirely for them. But in in a wider sense, do, do you encourage that peer support? Yeah, and, and some of them will use um, Facebook and some of them will use um, the VLE itself. It's, it's interesting, I mean, I'm not medical, but it's been very interesting working in the medical school. Um, I found a lot more reticence from medics, certainly historically, to set up a Facebook account than, say, in the art school, where it, it is part of their identity to have stuff out there online. The medics are a lot more, oh, I don't want a Facebook account. And, and I know that in life sciences, they had this issue as well with a few students saying, I don't want, I don't want that, um, you know, that online identity. So we do offer space within uh, the VLE. Uh, but I <laughs> we then, we have to make it very clear to the students we're not going to monitor this. We're not going to feed back on this. You know, it's, it's a bit like, I suppose, a student group having a coffee to dis and they're sitting there discussing their work. Now, they may be on a table next to me in the library or, you know, cafe. I'm not going to comment on their work because this is a coffee space. This is their space. Or they could have a coffee in town and then I'm not there at all. If it's on the VLE, sometimes they feel, oh, it's a discussion on the VLE, therefore a tutor should be monitoring it. So I think you need to make that expectation very clear to the student. We're going to monitor that one, but we're not going to monitor any of those. We're not even <coughs> going to look at them. I think that, that um, takes Emma's um, question into consideration there. And I think Emma and um, Mandy had kind of discussed that. Emma was looking at following on from that question um, how do you encourage uh, do you encourage a name tool or if you do have um, students who can't cope with using the Facebook or etc what kind of other alternatives is there but I think that's that was yeah. kind of covered yeah. mm -hmm. we have another question um, Carolina has asked how is sense of belonging measure, measured in research I think we'll leave that one, we'll park that one to the end of the next section, but I will definitely write it down because that is a very interesting area. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, any other questions or shall we indeed now move to sense of belonging? Or was oh, I yeah. think you'd like to add something? Have yeah, of course. Oh, okay, Susie. Um,
we can we cannot really understand Lucy. We cannot hear her. Right. So Lucy is asking about completion of modules. Yeah. I'm asking about completion procedures, and it's lovely to see a better completion rate for the cohort program. What I'm interested in are students moving from maybe the PG cert into the masters. Are you seeing any signs of that at the moment, Susie? Right, so the question was about progression from one stage to the next. And certainly historically, a lot of, oh, can you still not hear me? We can hear you, Susie, but it was difficult to hear your right. colleague. Okay. So the question was about, yes, we've seen a compl an increased completion rate of modules. Was there an, oh, yeah, you can. Oh, good. Yeah. But you said you can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It, what um, is there an increase in progression from certificate di diploma and diploma to the full masters? And although it's early days, um, we do seem to have doubled the number of master's students in in a year. Um, I and that's something I'm most definitely keeping an eye on. Um, yeah, Mandy's doing a little shocked face. Mandy did know that. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, that I think will be very interesting to look at because obviously at the moment we've got a lot of students who came from the non-cohort and have been sort of pushed through because the cohorting does push you through and they've enjoyed it. So one of my current master's students, she was non-cohort for the certificate. She cohorted for the diploma. She said she so much preferred the cohorting she learned so much more. She learned loads from her peers. There were really good discussions going on um, online, which wasn't happening on the non-cohort, even though it was online. And she's now moved on to the full masters. And it's um, difficult to, you know, to say definite. Would she have made it anyway? I don't know, but I'll keep an eye on the figures if they go up even more. We'll um, be asking you all to take on at least three master students. <laughs> um, no, but we'll we'll we, and we're also starting to build in more um, formative peer feedback at the dissertation stage. So, for example, we're getting them to look at um, each other's ethics applications. So, you know, and that that is all within the tight you know, the VLE. So again, we can have those discussions about what's shared on the VLE and what can go out with the VLE. So we're able to have ethical discussions about ethics. So that's quite nice. But definitely, I will be able to report back in a couple of years time um, more clearly, I think, seeing whether there are more people going through to masters. But definitely at the moment, I feel there are, but that is confounded by the backlog of Blackboard people who were, uh, sorry, when I say Blackboard, I mean non-cohort. It, it, um, it's just that we used Blackboard for them and we used Moodle now. But that, you know, is that just our backlog coming through or is it supporting people more to go through to the full masters? Also, of course, you know, the, the, um, the landscape is changing all the time. So we've seen in education that there is a push from the Scottish government for students for the teachers to become students again to do a full master's. Is that happening in medical education as well? So that might be nothing to do with the cohorting. That is from external pressures that people need their CVs to look better. They're always, you know, with the competition, the consultant jobs, or if they're wanting to go into an educational um, job, then, you know, that may also be putting a pressure on. Okay. Okay. And at this point, we should um, continue with the second part of your presentation. Okay. So I talked about the five problems identified. And you'll remember the last one, the isolation of students and tutors. So I started getting very interested, having met Susie um, at a QAA workshop, about this whole concept of sense of belonging. Whoops, which my mouse has just, just knocked my mouse. There we go. So one of my PhD students, Hassan Sethi, 
he he was looking at the impact of our courses. He was looking at both our small face-to-face -face cohorts and our much larger online distance learning course. And um, of whom we now have about a thousand. And he was looking at, you know, why why would professionals want to do distance learning rather than full time? And he found that they were able to apply their learning day to day as they went along. So the graduates on the distance program noted many impacts. They felt that they were more able to lead various educational activities and innovations, both during their studies and beyond. They received improved internal peer and student and external evaluations. They noticed improved student performance, which maybe isn't surprising because they were learning a lot about the principal assessment and about support and about formative feedback. They were able to win competitive grants for educational projects. They were attaining course accreditation and registration for their institution. They also highlighted, though, an increased sense of belonging to the community of practice. Now, the community of practice they were referring to was as health educators. So an increased sense of belonging to that community. But what about the sense of belonging to our community? So time to engage brain. And Susie is now going to ask you some questions. I'll get her to lean over to Should the mic. lean over a little bit more? Someone confirm that you can hear me. My voice is quite quiet and quite soft. Um, thank you very much indeed, Mandy. Um, it's been a great honour to work with Susie, and we've been very interested in this sense of belonging. But before we launch in and talk about our work, it's sometimes worthwhile just standing back for a minute and thinking about what does belong mean? So we have three questions for you and would like you to just have a pause and to think about, think about a time when you felt you belonged in a group. How would you describe that feeling? And what helps you feel that you belong? And how do you know you belong? And shall we just give a few minutes, Susie? Just a minute. Just a minute and perhaps jot down a few thoughts that you have to those three questions. Do you want us to do on the slide? Or in the chat? Yeah. Okay. If you would like to pop that into the chat, that would be lovely. If you would like to share. Thank you very much indeed for your postings to the chat. Um, it is very much a, a psychological thing as well as a social thing. And if you read any of the literature, they always talk about that feeling that this is where I should be. Mandy, I love your talk, love your post about sense of warmth. This is where mm -hmm. I should be, but also where my identity is. So as we're going through this, have a think about. How do you instill that in a particularly an online program? And I liked uh, one of you was talking about knowing people's names. And um, one of the things we stress in the toolkit is making sure that obviously the students know your name as a tutor, but that they do know other students' names as well, and giving time for that to happen. Whilst we're, we're going to just move into the next question because you've given some lovely ideas about what helps and what makes you feel you belong. But I'm sure you can all think of examples of when you didn't 
thought you belonged. And when you think, oh no, this isn't for me. This isn't where I should be. And it might be in a group, it might be academically, it might be socially, but we all know that feeling of, uh uh, this is not where I should be. And then try to imagine that be feeling when you're online. So what went wrong and was it anyone's fault at all? Mandy, I'll thank you very much for that, being ignored. And again, students who are at a distance, there's, all, there's that feeling already you are at a distance from your tutor and from your colleagues. So how do we generate that sense of belonging? Yeah. Um, P, I like your idea of space. Um, a lot of Hannah Carruthers Thomas work talks about space for students who are part-time, who only come to our campuses part-time, and the importance of them having a space where they can all meet and they can say, that's where we are. But how do we do that online? And that's why it becomes so important to think about our virtual learning spaces and also allowing our students to create spaces where perhaps they don't want us to be. And as you were talking about perhaps not having a Facebook area, students may not be comfortable with that, but giving them an online cafe space. Diane, I love your idea about that your ideas weren't worth anything. Um, you're reminding me of Strayhorn's work, and he's done a lot of uh, exploration of sense of belonging, again, for campus-based students. And he gives this, um, he gives this example of a student who was at an Ivy League university in the States, and he came from a much more working class background. And he felt he just didn't belong there. And when he tried to share his ideas, he was almost laughed down and laughed at. And so that terrible sense of, it's not where I should be. Carolina, I like that idea of making sure people are working on the strength, same thing. And I think, Susie, you've given a nice example of that, of having the cohort together so they are working together. And I'm sure you've got some examples of that where your students are posting, say, hey, I'm stuck on this. Can you help me? Mm. Yeah. Now let me move on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I apologise. OK. Um, and also, sense of belonging we're seeing is very affirmable, very temporary. You may have it one day and then something small can happen. Maybe you're working in a group and one person leaves that group and suddenly that sense of belonging isn't quite so strong. And then you're thinking, well, is this really the right place for me? And it's explaining to our students how they can keep developing that sense of belonging and us as tutors taking responsibility. And I've been talking to Susie quite a lot us as the institution taking responsibility and making sure that is a sense of belonging not only through the academics but also through our administration and through the great work that our professional services staff do. So again these are the sorts of things we're thinking about but a lot of the work at the moment is campus-based face-to-face sense of belonging but now we've got so many of our programs moving online. Sense of belonging, we all feel is a very good thing, but how do we promote it so that our students can flourish in the online environment? And here we've got Gudenu's definition, and it is enormously difficult whenever you get any educationist together to talk about what is sense of belonging and get any sort of definition. But I find that good to know for me is a really good place to start and I think it encapsulates some of the ideas that were coming through in the chat and it's feeling that you are accepted, you are valued, this is the place, if you weren't there people would miss you, people would say well where is, where is Susie, what's happening? So there's also that feeling that you belong here, you have the skills, the knowledge, and that you deserve to be here as well, and you've got that confidence. It's a lot more than just feeling 
warmth and light. And I like good in those definitions because you've got that personal autonomy, which and that self-efficacy we can talk a lot about. So I find that a good, um, I find her work a really good place to start. We're just going to move on now and give you a flavour of the QAA project that Susie and myself are involved with, along with the Open University and also from, Dun um, also from the University of Highlands and Islands. And we're very lucky to have Prof Cowan from Napier University as a critical friend. So what was our project about? What is it about now? So the first thing is, well, I get very excited about sense of belonging. But what, what does, how, how does it help student behaviour? And how can we distinguish that impact? And I know that's going back to the measuring question, which always worries me, Susie. <laughs> Susie, do you want us to pause here for a second? Or do you want us to go on I to think the next? It's really hard to hear you right now. Oh, sorry. It's probably because you're not straight on, Susie. Yeah. yeah, so if people could post um, just a, any thoughts they have on this question, what impact does sense of belonging have on student behaviour, on their learning? Thinking about, you know, what you may have noticed, or if you're not using online learning at the moment, maybe on your face-to-face -face learning. And just while you're pausing to chat, um, I would like to talk to respond to Ginny's posting about students not always knowing how to make the best use of the cafe space. We've certainly found this. Um, we have an induction whereby we encourage students to do this. We talk about the benefits of it. And we often ask students who have taken our modules previously to come in and talk to our students. We found that to be enormously helpful. Um, I hope that you're able to hear us. So any feedback so far about sense of belonging? Hey Mandy, you're saying you've got a gut feeling about um, students who don't appear to engage online are less likely to do well in their summative and that's something certainly that um, Linda and myself have noticed um, on MER and, uh, and, and other modules. So that's something that we are starting to look at in a, in a more rigorous way now um, and I believe that's going to be part of the focus of Linda Jones' work um, with SAFA, um, within CME, looking at exactly that. Um, now, again, we've got the whole question of cause and effect. Is it the ones who are likely to succeed anyway that are taking part in the discussion boards? So watch this space. <laughs> okay, um, Caroline, Caroline, definitely going on to answer your question. Um, Diane, you're saying it's important to encourage at the beginning of the module, or you might lose students who feel they don't belong. That's a, a good point, but again, picking it up as you go through, not thinking all the work. You have to do a lot of work at the beginning, but you know, as we've talked about how you can very easily then lose that focus. Maybe, I mean, I can remember from my own experience of my teacher training, when I put in my first essay and I failed it, that certainly made me feel I didn't belong. I had no right to be there. What was I doing thinking that um, someone who'd done a physics degree um, could actually ever write an ed educational essay. Um, so how we handle the feedback, which is why we put a lot of work into our feedback dialogue, I think is very important for maintaining that sense of belonging. 
Uh, Wendy, I'm really excited by your comment here about students who have that sense of belonging are much more likely to ask for support. Mm. I think what we're finding now is students who are much more self-regulatory, know what's going on when they can get help, will much more likely stay with us. And yes, the research is always out about the impact of sense of belonging, but from what we're seeing is, and I think a little bit from Susie's presentation earlier, that the more sense of belonging you have, the students do tend to stay. Um, and Strayhorn would argue, and the better results they get. And he would even say, if you don't have a sense of belonging, you're not going to be able to engage academically. Now that's highly debated, but that's his stance on it. Um, I do take your point, uh, I can't quite see who made that comment about the discussions. And yes, we do have always from time to time students who like to come in and who will like to hog online discussions. And our job as tutors is to decide how we handle that so that some students don't feel, well, I've got nothing to say. And I remember one of my students saying after a few weeks, everybody's looking such academic and urbane postings, I have nothing yeah. to say. And I spent a lot of time with that student, building that student's confidence and saying, well, you give one little piece of feedback which is taken from your particular professional expertise and gradually, gradually develop your experience. Yeah. There's lots I could mm. respond to this. Um, <laughs> Susie, I'm always having problems with your mouse. Excuse me if I could couldn't. Thank you. Right. Um, this is just a very quick summary of some of the research. And if you're interested in the references, please contact Susie. From definitely from face to face and from a little of the emergent research on online, if students do have a sense of belonging, it does seem to be that they stay, they have got more, they're more tenacious, they feel this is what I've invested in, this is where I want to stay. The impact is also engagement, and we've talked quite a lot about curriculum design here. I think Susie's been very clear about activities, not only at the beginning, the induction stage, but throughout the module, keeping students working together. And I was interested in the posting about working together and then having to uh, post and, uh, as a student piece of work. And I've seen that very much with my students. Getting students to work together. Yeah, excellent. Does seem sense of belonging, student well-being. You wouldn't be surprised by that. Self-efficacy, be again feeling this is where I belong. I've got the confidence to belong. And this is how I can get out of a problem. I know who to contact. And that's again linking to what we provide as an institution, not just as tutors. Um, and autonomy and empowerment. So if you're interested, drop us a line and I'm happy to send you to lots of um, articles. But what we wanted to finish was is to uh, explain to you that Susie and myself and colleagues in the QAA project, we are developing a toolkit which we want to really encourage people to think about how do we promote it in these online and distance programs. So the toolkit, uh, ah, right, uh, <laughs> right, the, uh, right. The toolkit looks at before the module starts, during the module, and as you're closing the module. But throughout, it will focus on the assessment because we know that assessment drives learning so much. And here are some of the examples. This is only our first draft, so again, happy to have your feedback about some of the things that you can do to actually promote a sense of belonging. Now, I'm going to choose one of them, and then I'm going to ask Susie to choose another one. This wasn't planned, so Susie is slightly looking well at me. Um, for us, the one that I would say is really important is that we do, well, we do two videos. We do a video from learners who have taken the program, giving really their key advice. And we also do a video of the team introducing themselves and explaining 
how they will support the students and making sure that students have not only got a face but a voice that goes with a particular name. Now, what about you, Susie? What would you do? I, I think, you know, we've talked, um, so several people have mentioned the importance of communication and not being ignored. So I think introducing the programme team early on, including key support staff, yeah. so the students know where to go if they have any problems, and making sure that the programme team, including key support staff, know how and when they should be feeding back and the importance of letting people, you know, management know if there isn't the resource to do that, because that seems so key to me, having the resource to answer those early questions. I think that fits in quite nicely what you're saying with what Jimmy has just posted there and about making protective time. And this is something I work with the tutors and myself is our lives are so busy. We're always running around. We've got so many meetings. But if you had a class, that would be protected time for your students. Yeah. What we now do is put protected time into our diaries for our students. Otherwise, that gets eaten up. And I was once said, well, Susie, you keep that protected time. But what happens if the principal wants you? I say, my students are expecting me at that time. OK, we also have um, guidance for starting the module and talking about how you can, for example, providing a calendar of key dates for the module, obviously the assessment one, but asking the students to share their hopes for the module and the worries. I, I like both of those, so very helpful indeed. Then we've got during the module, again, we don't want to do that, and nudging learners, always keeping with them, and then finally, relating everything to the assessment so it's constantly saying look at the assessment way look at what you're doing how does this link build up to that final assessment and then i think we've got the last one at the end of the module and always for me it's asking students to go back to that initial posting when they thought that what they were going to get from the module so that's it. Susie, thank you very much indeed for allowing me a little bit of airspace to talk about our toolkit. And it, it's been absolutely wonderful. And Diane, I'm just seeing there, it's marking on holidays, particularly if you're getting students to work in groups to make sure they're sharing their holiday dates, especially when we're coming up, for example, the Easter holidays. Right, thank you very much indeed, Susie. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just Going back to a question that Ginny, you posed, is Ginny still here? So I, I've not got my list up of who's still here. I'm still here. Excellent. I'm, I'm aware that uh, I am almost at the end of my hour. <laughs> um, you were talking about the nurturing sense of belonging, and sometimes it worked really well on modules, but not in other modules. Do I remember yeah. that correctly? Yes, and I'm just I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on why that might be. I think um, a lot to do with the structure, how students are, like you're saying, how they're informed. So we we do a lot of the the um, points that you've raised at the last few slides by the video, by the instructions, because we have students who maybe it's their fourth module, but it may be their first module. And I think depending on if you have a if you do like you say the groundwork to begin with and you have that structure in place, then students actually feel supported. They feel that they, they know where to go, they know how the process is. Whereas I feel in some possible modules where there isn't as much structure, and it may have been that it's you know it's it's been a, a change from a face to face to an online, you know, it's had to happen, then that can sometimes be a bit of a disarray. Yeah. For students. Yeah. I mean, when, when we moved to cohort, um, certainly initially on a module that I run on technology enhanced learning, I would put up a Padlet for people to ask questions of an expert. And then we had an open, you know, a, a, a collaborate session like this. 
um, where I would interview the, um, you know, the expert with the questions that have been provided, but it was a synchronous um, activity, so they could still come online at the set time, there was plenty of warning, and that then nobody turned up, nobody turned up for the, um, to the first one. And so I interviewed Ellie about her um, flu scenario on Twitter, um, which was very innovative. And it was fine because I had the questions from the Padlet, so that asynchronous, and then we posted up the recording. And so the next year, I didn't bother with the synchronous bit. I just did it with the, you know, um, the the padlet and the and, and then the recording but then as they've got as we've got the ones who have started off with mandy's learning and teaching where she's done that really good groundwork that scaffolding that ensuring they're comfortable that there's that expectation um persephone and i ran a synchronous um one hour work um classroom for same module technology enhanced learning and we had very good engagement we had you know we even had um someone join us halfway through because he'd had some problems connecting and he was so thrilled to join us he was joining us from china where it was half past 11 at night and he said at the end he said oh that has given me such a feeling that i belong to this to this cohort so yeah so yes, please, people that need to go do go because um, yes, it was it was timetabled for one hour. Thank you for all your comments um, and your questions. Uh, Great. Just one thing before we all disappear, really. Um, what would be interesting from my point of view of what what Tile wants, right, is um, this research informed approach. And um, you mentioned here and there that there is research backing up um, the idea that sense of belonging is important, and um, there are different factors that contribute to sense of belonging, and therefore then um, uh, affect uh, academic performance and retention. I'm just wondering, um, first of all, um, could you share with us maybe the three top papers um, in your view in regards to um, to make that claim so that we can share it because we always write a, a reflection report on our Thai network talks and so we can add it there. And based on your recommendations that you gave, um, have given us in the um, end of your presentation, uh, for before and in between and after um, the course, what would be your top three, based on research, what are the top three recommendations to enhance um, sense of belonging? For online learners or all learners? Doesn't matter. <laughs> right, I do the literature and I'll let Susie do the top three. Um, the first literature is from Thomas who has particularly researched into online learning and sense of belonging. And I would strongly recommend looking at her article. She emphasizes particularly the importance of synchronous sessions. But a lot of the other things we've talked about. So Thomas would be number one. The second one is another Thomas, but this is a Liz Thomas who undertook the work called What Works. She is particularly looking at attrition in face-to-face -face work. Her work is very well known. And uh, again, she then talks about sense of belonging. So I would look at that. And then the last thing is, is another Thomas, Hannah Carruthers Thomas, who has recently published a book on a sense of belonging. But I would recommend just go to that number one from Thomas. And I will leave you the references for Susie to share. Um, I can't remember exactly which journal Thomas. No, that's fine. Amazing. As long so as someone can, Thomases. if someone can pop in the references in the chat, that would be great, or in an email later on. And do you know, um, do you know those studies um, or the research that you just mentioned? Are those experimental research or is it um, are those correlational studies? It's always qualitative research because it's educational research. And if you look, um, I was asked one day, could I find a measure of sense of belonging? Could somebody please give this? And I remember spending one happy Sunday morning 
looking through all the psychological articles I had on sense of belonging. And they all have different measures of sense of belonging. And nobody, but nobody has got one that is consistently agreed upon. So my answer there is, please don't go that way. <laughs> Susie, what are the three top things that you suggest? So I think communication is the absolute key one. And I'd re I've already mentioned, for example, you know, making sure that the team is introduced, that the key contacts, that they know where to ask questions and that e these are addressed in a timely fashion. So very much like our feedback rules, you know, that uh, guidance, that they are answered in, in language that the students understand, because I, I think, you know, we, we've talked a lot, Susie and myself, about the the opposites of sense of belonging and really it's a sense of alienation mm -hmm. and not understanding the language is very alienating so ensuring the language is understood in that communication um, the second one I would say is um, allowing the students space to introduce themselves so just mm -hmm. like you've all introduced yourselves here um, and, and some of you have had a picture and some of you haven't but you've all got your name there and said you know who you are where you're from so we very much encourage our students to do that at the beginning and then we will find that you know there'll be someone saying oh i'm in canada too whereabouts are you so you know they're they're forming that sense of belonging within the community of learners and the third one i would say is creating spaces for peer support and not always jumping in as tutors so for example on each of our modules we have a discussion board that is purely for assessment questions and we monitor those as tutors but we don't answer straight away unless someone gives the wrong advice or unless it's really urgent um, we we tend to leave it maybe 24 hours maybe 48 hours and we find increasingly that people will offer the support themselves, the peers. And I, from my own experience, I know how valuable it is to your sense of belonging when you go from, you know, you think of um, community of learners, uh, Lavi and Wenger's work, and you think about going from that, you know, legitimized peripheral participation to that bit where you're actually an expert within that community. And even if your expertise is on that particular thing, where do I find how to um, you know, upload my assessment? Something, it could be a very quick question. The tutor could answer that really quickly, but I think there is a real value in developing that community of learners, that feeling of we're all in it together. And we've had some fantastic examples of that on CME. And I remember on um, very early on in learning and teaching, it got to the point where they were all really stressed about the assessment date coming up. And this particular cohort, it was our very first cohort. So they were all actually from, black, from our non-cohort program, had come over to the cohort program, these particular ones. They were really stressed about having this submission deadline. And so one of them posted a picture of a slice of lemon meringue cake. And I thought, that's lovely. <laughs> Have some cake. Here's for everyone who's feeling stressed. And I thought, you know, that's the type of thing that might happen face to face. Now, I know it was a little piece of lemon meringue. But I just thought, and you could then tell from the other students' reactions how this, how, how nice they felt this was. It was someone understanding their needs, totally calorie free. <laughs> Thanks very much to that quotation that you had about being treated as a person, mm. not just a number or not someone who is in some far flung place like China, but who is actually treated as a person, not only by your peers, but your tutor, the professional services staff, and by the institution. And there's that feeling of being empowered in that way. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you, you for you. allowing me to join you in this session. Yes. It's been lovely to meet everyone. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. And uh, apologies for going over time. No um, worries. No worries at all. <laughs> and, and yes, we'll put together a reference list and um, we'll pick up on any questions that we didn't have a chance 
to answer. Um, oh, thank you, Mandy. I could appreciate it. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Persephone and Natalie. Yeah, and, I, um, I would like yeah. to thank you, Susie and Lucy, for um, joining us and for giving this um, terrific presentation and also um, being our inaugural uh, webinar presenters. And um, so I hope um, we can continue this as a webinar. I enjoyed it and um, see you all next time. Bye bye. And, I, and I'd like to thank you, Carolina, for that lovely slide you showed of where everything was for people. <laughs> that was very nice, very clear, and that, you know, probably helped people not feel alienated. And it's those little things that we do that make so much so much difference. Mandy has got much more experience than I have of uh, using Collaborate as asked if she can copy it. You'll have to oh, reference no. Carolina. <laughs> no, <I'm all> <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much everyone and bye bye. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.